tonight on The Breakdown. We unpack a scintillating all-black performance on Saturday and find out if the coaches are happy. John Plumtree's in the house. A bleeders low win, but what's next? We get the latest on our trans-Tasman bubble trouble from NZR top dog Mark Robinson. Plus our greatest 15 as voted by you. Kia ora, greetings, welcome to Breakdown, where we plan to do exactly that, break down the bledders low, just like the All Blacks did to Wallaby hopes and dreams. The All Blacks wrapping up the cup in really a little over 40 minutes. Goldies carving up the slopes this week, so if you're in the South Island and near the white stuff, make sure your helmet's on and uh, you're close to ski patrol medics. So John Kerwin, Chelsea Alley and Justin Marshall, our team for tonight. JK, last week you said that you witnessed, what was it, the worst 15 minutes of test rugby that you'd ever seen, but I saw you nodding, clapping, maybe even a few Italian superlatives coming out. Yeah, outstanding performance. I thought, uh, I, I went and had another look at it, I just thought they were outstanding for 80 minutes, especially when Artie got yellow carded. They really mm. showed great leadership. And the question I'll ask you all, which is always a good one, is did anyone play badly? Oh, that's a good question. Mm. Well, you called it, Justin. What do you reckon? Did you get any words in with eight tries or so? It was Not really, fantastic. which can't be a bad thing at times, I'd imagine. But it was, it was literally raining tries there, wasn't it? And that's, that's the type of rugby we want to see. Like, I think when you, two teams can express themselves... And don't get me wrong, Australia contributed as well, didn't mm. they? they? They gave as good as they were, were getting for long periods of that game. So... Oh, it was entertaining. I really enjoyed it. You must have been inspired, Chelsea, because, boy, oh boy, Waikato on <laughs> Sunday really brought it. It was insane. Oh, yeah, it was. Um, got the win in the 82nd minute, which is which is awesome, because last year in the final we lost lost it in the 82nd minute. So it's actually good to know that we can we can come back and turn that around. And what was it, 27 all? Here's the match winner. Absolutely unbelievable denying Wellington. And who added the treats at the end? Yeah, I, I got the last conversion. That was my only kick of the game right out in front, so I can't take too much credit but oh it's just it's awesome to see the girls dig deep like that um the final kick wellington took when they scored that last try there was about 10 seconds left um the hooter ran uh, went as we were walking back to halfway wow. so we looked at each other but there was just heaps of belief in the girls eyes which was pretty awesome well you really should be in the triage unit because your body took an absolute <laughs> hammering oh, how man, you yeah. managed to actually get here tonight <laughs> is i'm clapping i'm clapping beyond me Check that out. In fact, yeah. Chelsea did say um, I wasn't trying to get my jeans on tonight because my legs are so swollen. So bravo. Oh, yeah. out that's old school. Old yeah. school rucking's going but, on there. Yeah, that's what I said. I, eh? Are you allowed to ruck? Well, I just think when, when a group of Wellington Fords see an inside back lying on the bottom of the ruck, yeah. there's only one way they're getting them out there. So <laughs> probably my own fault, but it happened a few times. So, yeah. That's why I never went to a ruck. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's, let's get out of the ruck and climb into the All Blacks on the weekend. Uh, serious improvement from the All Blacks. JK, what's your summation? How's our blueprint looking for the team and how it's tracking? You know, I've really enjoyed the series, the whole series, talking about Fiji as well. Tonga probably not so much. I saw some things early in the piece where they were playing the loose forwards on the outside, but I really enjoyed the balance the other night. I think Akira Ioane out wide when yep. he can run like a back. Cody Taylor back to some good form. I actually thought that we didn't use the pods as much, so not double pods, so getting around them and getting wide with with some uh, you know, some loose forwards out right who are, who are great athletes. So I thought it was a really nice balance to it and the physicality was up there. Mm, I think, yeah, just from la the, the week before, sorry, um, the ABs were just clinical in everything they did. They they were really structured and they knew what they wanted to do. So just to see, I think that's the sign of a good team. And we did speak about it last week. If if you can improve from one week to the next playing against the same team, you've obviously done your review right, you've previewed well, and they've come out there and put the display on. And the composure, Justin, because, yeah. you know, when Artie was off, we scored two tries. That's right. And, and to be able to do that under pressure uh, at that stage of the game, when they were under the pump, survive that moment, but then put points on when you've got someone in the bin. That takes real maturity. Look, he had to make some selection um, issues as well. I guess he got the same players back out there, shifted Rico to centre um, through injury and through necessity, which worked. They were much more direct than what they were the weekend before where they were lateral. So that group made the adjustments from the week before and put on a real clinical performance um, with not that um, huge amount of ball. So, so it wasn't that the Aussie were worse. 
do you think it was us making the gains? Oh, I tried to analyse that this morning when I when I re-looked at the game because I was sort of thinking, am I kidding myself? Because I thought the Australians were very, very good I did too. at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, absolutely immature in their maturity, if that's a, how you can put to those two words together. Probably not, but anyway. You've done it. I have done it. So the All Blacks have been closing the gate. So closing the gate means outside in defence. And Australia make the same mistake three times. Mm last week and then twice on Saturday night. I mean, that is... So we're talking so, intercepts. Yeah, intercepts. But I was also really, really disappointed in uh, Tamur. I think he's an outstanding player. I think he's having a good season. I thought we would have seen more kicking to stop what you're seeing on your screens right now. Um, so Dave Rennie will go away and go, you know, we're playing really good in patches and then we're playing really stupid football. Mm -hmm. And that was three of those moments. Well, what they did was let the All Blacks off the hook at times, and, and that's what you can't do against a side that was in that type of mood, which the All Blacks were. Look, I've finally come onto the show and done some homework, um, <laughs> which, I want to, which I want to share with you, a bit of stat attack. Um, oh, but love but listen stat. to this to, to say how good the All Blacks were, but also how good Australia can be. Territory, 55-45 to Australia. Possession, 62-38 um, to 38 to Australia. Uh, rucks, 72-49 to 49 to Australia. Inside the 22, Australia were inside our 22 for eight minutes. Our New Zealand were only inside for three minutes. Handling errors, New Zealand made 11, Australia only made five. Mm. And finally, tackling, the All Blacks had to make 105 tackles, Australia only 84. So Australia dominated the game, statistically. On paper, yeah. And still got put to the sword by over 30 points. So they are going to be good. They just need to somehow find the mojo that's missing to make sure that they don't lose games, they should be winning statistically. So, so Mr Statman, <laughs> yep. what do you think they're missing? I think, they're, I think they're that ruthless edge that you talked about, I think the zones that they're in, and Dave Rennie sort of mentioned it after the game, he said, when Artie went in the bin, we, we missed the line-out throw. You know, those things you've mm. got to really grab a hold of and, and take your moments. They're not taking their opportunities. And that's immaturity to a degree. You know, both inside backs, I'd only played 14 tests between them. You know, there's not a lot of maturity there. They'll grow into that. Because they're test caps, what, 12 test caps between their 9 and 10, but yep. does that make you worry for, for a couple of weeks? Is two weeks enough for them to turn their game around and make those improvements, do you think, Chelsea? Yeah, I think I think, I think think it is, definitely. Like we've talked about, they've got the goods there. Mm. Um, the lack of maturity is a real interesting one. Like, you talk about the time um, in, in the 22s and the ABs, they're only in there for a few minutes, but they're able to convert. Yep. Whereas Aussie, they're spending a long time in there. That's when they need their experienced players and their leaders to step up and, and find ways to penetrate. Mm. Um, in turn as well, you know, those intercepts, that, uh, those were in key moments of the game where you just, you want to hold on to the ball, hold on to position, but I think some of those inside backs were feeling under pressure. They wanted to score points, obviously, but they just didn't have the experience or the maturity to hold on to the ball, build phases, um, put pressure on the All Blacks. They were looking for the big hero players with the, the balls over the top, which is where we pick them off. Yeah, Chelsea, I think that's a really interesting point because we often, as rugby players, talk about inexperience or young, not enough tests, but that's what it comes down to. Um, the first test, a young player without test experience will panic and rush things. Mm. You know, the All Blacks were off their game for 20 minutes in the first test and the fullback couldn't even kick it down into the 22. He, he sliced it, they missed the line out on the weekend. Those things really, really hurt. What happens to a mature team? Someone gets sent off, they slow the game down. Yeah. McKenzie takes a, you know, he, he took that from Sandringham Road just about. No you know, and got it over. Those things, and that just crushes you. You're a man, you're a man up, you know, they're a man down, they kick that goal, they slow it down, they kick it out, they nail their little rolls and you're not taking advantage of it, and it just gets to your confidence. Yeah, you're right, it was. It was an all-star performance, wasn't it? A great mm. team effort, but some individual brilliance as well. So the AB's getting the result. Uh, the Bledisloe tucked away in the cabinet for another year. One man who will still be grinning is NZR CEO Mark Robinson. He joins us now. Thanks for your time, Mark. And uh, did the cup get some, some silver dips and polish up before it went back into the cabinet? Uh, I haven't caught up on that. Uh, good evening, everyone. I, I haven't caught up with the progress of the trophy uh, since since Saturday night, but it was um, well looked after. I saw um, later on in the evening by the by one of the younger members of the squad, and they certainly uh, have as much pride and um, you know and, and sense of achievement uh, now as, as what they always have for around that trophy, and it's something that's dearly um, important to the team and the wider organisation. So yeah, we're, we're delighted, obviously.
All right, Mark, we want to chat Eden Park first. Uh, we got the result there, obviously, which was, was thrilling for everyone, fans and the All Blacks. But who chose Eden Park and why? And were you happy with the turnout? Uh, so there's a bit in that, Bernie. So, yeah, I mean, we, we uh, ultimately it was um, our decision along with Rugby Australia and Sansa um, in terms of the allocation of the, of the gra uh, ground. We obviously um, worked as hard as we possibly could for as long as we could um, to have the game staged in Wellington. But ultimately, because of the late um, change of the, of the test schedule uh, and the time it took us to reschedule the game from the 21st um, to the 28th in Perth, it meant we didn't have much time um, to work with. So ultimately, we chose um, Eden Park. Um, and there are a number of you know, logistical and, and commercial realities around that decision, as well as the timing. So, so that, that's how the decision came about. Um, the, the crowd, look, given we had eight or nine days to, um, to promote the game and um, sell tickets for the game, we are pleased we got 25,000 people there and delighted with the, the, um, the people that did turn out and, and show their support. You know, would have we liked more? Obviously, you know, it would have been nice to have had um, more people um, turn up to the game. But given all the challenges I just described, um, you know, we, we have to recognise that we're, we're living in extraordinary times. And, um, you know, that's the result we came up with. Robbo, uncertain times. We're still living in the middle of, um, you know, COVID. It's difficult for everyone. But I've been hearing rumours that the All Blacks possibly could be leaving and um, not coming back from Perth because of all sorts of different um, reasons. But I had an idea. I just thought I'd run it past you, see if we can do it. So we're vaccinated. The South Africans are vaccinated. I'm doing this because I do not want the 100th test in Perth, Robbo, please. I want it in Dunedin. But anyway, um, so why can't we... We're both vaccinated. We go over there. We play in our bubbles, which they're going to do. We charter a plane back and play this test match in Dunedin. Can we get that done or not? <laughs> Great. You're still at uh, ideas, man, JK. Look, you know, there's, there's lots of different um, advice we are getting and lots of different... Um, you know, speculation around what uh, what might be able to happen um, around those two test matches. And the, the first thing is, obviously, we, we would dearly love for those two games um, against the Springboks to be played at the end of September and start of October here in New Zealand. Um, we all recognise the significance of those games um, and the huge amount of importance they have of the legacy of the rivalry for so long that, that we're doing everything possible to try and make that happen. And we haven't given, you know, given up all hope. Um, but the reality is, yeah, we are living in, in really challenging times. Um, we do certainly respect um, the role the government has to balance this in, in incredibly tricky situation of the outright passion and love that Kiwis have of sport in our country with the fact that we have to keep our borders safe. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue that dialogue. We are certainly having regular conversations with all of the key agencies around, you know, trying to bring some form of rugby back um, into New Zealand um, before the end of the year. But as things sit now, it's it's challenging. Um, we haven't had formal advice around, you know, not being able to do that yet. So until we receive that, we'll be working really hard to try and uh, do everything we can to bring rugby back, back here before the end of the year. So, Mark, we understand it's a fluid time. There are lots of variables. But where are you at with the rugby championship? You have a team getting on a plane and from there, no return date as yet. Where are you at? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Bernie. We had a... Um, a good session with the team and management yesterday trying to um, communicate the what what we do know and, and what we are able to give certainty around and then um, what is still remains uncertain. Um, and, and at this stage, you know, you're right, the team gets on a plane on, on Sunday. Um, we are hoping to play um, as much of the rugby as we possibly can in, in Perth. Um, and we're just waiting on final confirmation from Sanzar and Rugby Australia who are working really hard um, right across, you know, Australia around the, the, the dates that we're uh, hoping to play. And uh, we, we haven't had the most, uh, you know, haven't had an update, you know, today as such on what's what's happening, but we're hoping to get some confirmation around those possible venues, um, you know, in the coming days. Um, with regard to these two, two South African games, as I said before, we're still hoping that we might be able to bring those back to New Zealand. That, that is looking challenging. Uh, from from those two games, it really depends on on what's available uh, to to be able to come back into New Zealand at this stage. You know, we won't find that out 
um, as, as regards to early October for some some time yet. But as I said earlier, we're continuing to work really hard um, on that. So we, we do face scenarios where um, if we're unable to come back into the country, then we'll, we'll have to obviously consider carrying on from Australia to, towards the Northern Hemisphere tour. Um, but we won't know um, exactly how that is going to play out um, for a little while yet. Uh, yeah, g'day, Mark. Um, so tomorrow actually marks two years since the last Black Ferns Test match. Um, and as a current player, it's been really tough. Um, so it came out not long ago that uh, we do have Aussie coming here that's been locked in. What certainty is there that those games are going to be played? And are there any contingency plans in place for us? Yeah, hi, hi Chelsea. Yeah, and again, great questions. Um, we're certainly you know, doing everything um, we possibly can to support the women's game at international level. Um, you know, I remember talking to her near the start of the year when we were talking about the unfortunate situation of having to postpone Rugby World Cup 2021 by a year and, and committing them to doing everything we could to provide the Black Ferns with opportunities to, to play. And that, that definitely remains um, a commitment of ours. Um, similar to where the All Blacks are at with those two games on those, those same two weekends, as you know, the, the Black Ferns were due to play the Wallaroos. So the same challenges exist around being able to play those two games on the 25th of September and the 2nd of October um, as well. Um, so we are looking at contingency around a, a possible domestic fixture um, to replace the Wallaroos if we if we need to. Um, and then we're hopefully, you know, only a matter of a few days away uh, from being able to announce what the end of year tour looks like for the Black Ferns and um, really committed to to also being able to get that tour away for the team to provide some international competition in the Northern Hemisphere. You know, alongside that, obviously, we're, we're getting closer to making more formal announcements around the Elite Women's 15s competition from next year onwards, which, um, you know, we're, we're really passionate about and have done everything we possibly can to resource well and, and make sure that's a, a competition befitting its sort of stature and also provides... Um, support for the for the Black Ferns into next year's competitions around the World Cup also. So lots happening in the in the women's game that we're we're extremely committed to. But yes, it is subject to the same uncertainty as, as other areas of the game at the moment, unfortunately. Hey, Robbo, it's your old sparring partner here and I'm uh, gonna slightly let you let you off the hook, you'll be pleased to know. Um, because You've mentioned the Northern Hemisphere. You then, mate. That's good. Oh, good, good man. Um, <laughs> you've mentioned the Northern Hemisphere, but before that, you've got this exciting prospect of the game in America. What, what was the background behind that, and what are you sort of trying to achieve within that game? Is that to, to showcase it, or is it, is it money orientated? Um, you know, looking forward to Washington DC for the first time, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, um, we we've, we've made you know. Um, no, no secret about the fact that we are interested in, in what um, a strategy looks like, uh, you know, going forward with this whole, you know, reset around the, the professional game in this part of the world that, that we think markets like Asia, especially Japan and North America are critical to our future. So that, that whole notion of a Pacific Rim region um, involving Australia, the Pacific, Asia and, and North America is really important to us. So this fixture is seen as a, as a key plank in, in, uh, in that strategy. Um, over time, we want to build out, you know, more than one-off matches as part of that, that strategy. We'd like to, you know, um, build closer connections with those parts of the world and ultimately have situations where we're talking about um, future, you know, professional competitions and ways that we can help to grow um, the game in those parts of the world. So, so initially, you know, we'd, we'd thought we might be playing that game a, a week later. It's um, panned out now because of a number of changes around schedule. We'll be playing on the 23rd of October. And the ground availability because of, um, you know, leagues such as the NFL has meant that we've landed in, in D.C. And we're absolutely thrilled and looking forward to, mm. to um, you know, committing to playing that part of the world. Uh, from what I understand, the ticket sales are going extremely well. And, and yeah, it's part of an overall, um, you know, growth push to, to, be, to be part of... Um, Rugby and over, overall, I think, commit to a globalisation of sport that needs to happen by, by virtue of supporting some of the more, you know, emerging nations um, around the world and sort of the USA fits into part of that, as well as being, as we all know, an extremely huge, um, you know, global um, sports market. You are one busy man and we so appreciate your time, Mark. Thank you. And uh, whatever the duration of the stint in Aussie and further, we hope it's successful and safe. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Dan. All right, well... Thank you. Crikey. You, you've kind of got a feel for the NZR, <laughs> don't you? Because 
there must be frustrations that they're being asked questions and they simply can't answer them. Well, there's not a stats. Yep. Oh, hang on. Nine, yeah, write this down. Yeah, 19,000 yeah. people a day apply for MIQ and there's 4,000 spots. So 19,000 a day. Apply per day and there's 4,000 spots. Is that people coming for a holiday or but, is it Kiwis wanting to repatriate? Oh, I don't know. Probably a bit of both, I should imagine. Trying to people trying to go and see family. Quick, Justin, like Statman. Statman, I've Which is it? <laughs> Break it down. I can't keep down. I can't keep up <laughs> He's with out it. Of ink. I think the question, I think the question for me is, um, are the rugby union asking the government to make an exception? For example, they can pay for a hotel, we can pay for security, we can do the borders around it, we can charter a flight. Um, are we allowed to do that or are the government saying, no, we're not going to give any special treatment? That's sort of what I need answered. Yeah. Because that, it seems sensible to me. The South Africans would jump in a plane with us. It wouldn't matter. No, it wouldn't. But that's the hard part of it, that the New Zealand Rugby Union dealing with the government. And they've, they've also... The government can't be seen to be favouring the All Blacks. So I think at the end of the day, what, what they've got to sort of take into the equation is the fact that this is what they do. And there's going to have to be some sacrifices because these are very unprecedented times. So whatever gets put in front you, of them as a player, you you've got to get country, on with it. Though, do you seriously think the country would mind? I mean, the Olympics made my three weeks. I, was, I just loved... I mean, I love sport, mm. you know? Do you think the general public would mind if there was a little bit of exception for the All Blacks to play a test match? Well, oh, there'll be some... Should we Japan vote on it? it. There'll be some Board there. warriors, mate. Don't worry about that. They'll be, they'll be there. <laughs> the one man who is going to be on the plane to Perth is forwards coach John Plumtree. Plum, so great to have you join us. Uh, the boys have a week off now. How did they pull up after the game and, uh, dare I say it, after the celebrations? <laughs> Oh, hi, Benny. Um, yeah, look, uh, the boys are fine. I think we've, there's one or two little niggles, um, as you expect from such a physical test match. But, um, yep, got an email from Doc today with one or two little things, but um, pretty much good to go. Hey, Plums, congratulations. Outstanding uh, performance right across the board, I thought. But what's really interested me is, I know Sam Whitelock's been around a while, but his decision-making in both test matches was quite outstanding. You know, kicking for the corner in the first test match, slowing the game down when Artie gets sent off, um, going for the corner and then changing and taking shots at goal. He just seems to be a natural under pressure, which is not easy. Yeah, no, you know, I mean, Sam will be first to say he's got some excellent leaders around him that help him with all those little decisions. But I guess, um, you know, He's been around a fair while, and he's you know been a lot, involved in a lot of big games. So you know he um, you know it all comes pretty naturally to old, old Big Sam. So um, yep, we're pleased with the obvious, obviously the um, penalty shot at goal, um, and that Damien Noel that just gave us ate up a little bit of time on the clock when Artie was in the bin. And um, yeah, like you say, going to the corner um, was it at half before half time last week? Another good decision. So yep, it's done done very well. Uh, yeah, hey Plum. Um, so just looking forward, South Africa obviously very set piece dominant. Uh, how does your focus shift in the Black uh, Black Ferns and the All Blacks um, to take that that part of the game away from them? Um, hi Chelsea. Um, yeah, look, um, I thought the set piece battle was a real a real battle in the weekend. Actually, I mean we tried to drive them over and we couldn't. Um, they tried to drive us over and you know and they couldn't. Um, and, you know, there was a couple of scrums before half time where they got a little bit of dominance. And then, you know, in the second half, there were some scrums that, you know, our, you know, our reserves came on and got some dominance. So, um, yeah, it was a, it was a interesting game from a set piece point of view. Um, and, you know, we put a lot of pressure on their line out, particularly in bleed one. And, um, I think we won, you know, three or four crucial line outs, um, you know, when we, con when we were conceding penalties, um, and then, you know, they put a bit of pressure on our line out in the weekend. So it was, uh, it was a real battle up front for the big boys. Hey, Plums, Marshy. Uh, firstly, congratulations on the weekend. I thought it was an outstanding performance. And I know you guys had some boxes you wanted to tick from the week before. Um, and you certainly achieved that. Uh, I sort of want to now look a little bit more into the future. You've, you've got this challenge of not knowing how short a time or longer time you're going to be away. It could be up to three months. What's your process in preparing the players and, and, your, and your whole group in general uh, for what, what lies ahead? 
Um, yeah, that started probably um, probably two weeks ago, really, when we when there was a little bit of doubt about uh, rugby championship in New Zealand, and um, obviously the bubble closed. Um, I think one of the big things that Fozzie's been really upfront with right from the start and the leaders is making sure that we uh, inform the team, the management of um, you know everything that we learn. Um, and making sure that, um, you know, there's no surprises for them. So when we find out information, we uh, we give it to the team. Um, the leaders have been outstanding and making sure that um, the team remains calm, uh, especially over bled one, bled two, which are such massive games. You know, there was no, absolutely no ways we want to take the better's like cut across to Australia. So, um, yeah, so being open and honest and everything we knew, um, you know, the, obviously New Zealand working with New Zealand rugby and informing everyone that um, what was going on was was key to it. Um, we we didn't want to be distracted um, going into um, you know the big bleed two game. Um, so yeah, now we're at this point um, where we've got a few days at home with our family and. Uh, which is which is great for everyone, particularly for for the for the boys with you know very young children, um, and we we meet and we go and we don't know when we're coming back, um, which uh, which is um, I, I guess it you know the back of your mind it makes you a little bit anxious, but at the end of the day you know we're we're paid to do this job and the boys are love they love playing for the All Blacks and um, we just you know trust that. Um, New Zealand rugby will work um, well with the government in terms of trying to get us home um, to refresh, particularly before we head off to the UK, which is, you know, five weeks if we play, um, you know, all the games that we need to over the year, plus, you know, a couple of weeks of quarantine. So um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long haul if we, um, if we don't get back um, after the rugby championship um, in Australia. You know, it's looking, if we don't play the box, in New Zealand, it's uh, it's six seven weeks over in Australia, and then a couple of weeks before we can actually fly out to the to to America if that game's on. So it's a fairly long haul. So um, yep, we just have to um, uh, embrace it and look walk towards it, and you know enjoy it. You know we've got a great management, we've got a great uh, group of players that really enjoy each other's company, and uh, we'll have to get inventive with how we go about our our business over there in terms of keeping everyone fresh and making sure that. You know, we um, we enjoy ourselves because, as you know, tours it's it's so important. Thank you so much for your time, Plum. We wish you and the team all the very best. And if it's going to be a long trip, uh, we suggest equal amounts of socks and undies, as you would hand san <laughs> sanitizer and face masks. So keep safe. All the best. Thank you, Benny. All right. Uh, you hope that it all works out for the team because it sounds like it could be a long stint away from home. Uh, we are changing things up a little this week after weeks of tapping out on the trivia questions uh, to dominating. JK's turning quiz master and will be holding court for this week's trivia. Cannot wait. Da, 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 da. Fire away. I know you've been itching too. Oh, I'm excited I, I, about this one. I'm so excited about this. <laughs> this will be something from the Feeling 1920s, the I reckon. Yes, oh. it will. <laughs> I'll, I'll <laughs> Black and white. Don't yeah. Yeah. Just clear my throat. Uh, which <laughs> former All Black played soccer... Rugby and Rugby League for Samoa. Yes! Whew. Rugby, Rugby Rug League and soccer. soccer. Rugby and Rugby League for Samoa. And he obviously former, played for the All Blacks as former well. Former All Black. Hey, we might leave this one to Stats Guy. JK <laughs> is throwing curveballs. Uh, he wants ownership of the trivia, doesn't he? I think it's payback. Uh, so while we phone a friend, check out the skills on show at the FPC this weekend. Back in a jiff. We're into week five of the 2021 Bunnings Farah Palmer Cup is tearing up. Break it away, tearing up. Catching off the napping, tearing up. Scores. Now Brunt, straining up Brunt. Still going, sells the dummy. Scores the try. Auckland hit the lead. Auckland win the game. 13 points to 10. Running ball, that's intercepted. Steinmetz has just read it beautifully. She's got the pace to skip away. Gap it to the line, gives it off to Duplessis, who runs on the outside line, and she goes straight through the gap. Down the left, and she's in. They shift it once more. Crystal Murray just needs to find her winger. She does. A oh, beautiful line back on the inside. 
quirky you outdo yourself every week. Welcome back to Breakdown, everybody. Sir JK, Chelsea, Ali and Justin Marshall, your team for tonight. While Goldie's at prey skiing and enjoying a glass of Central Otago's finest, no doubt. All right, our brains have been put through the Bronco test in the break. Um, we've got the trivia and JK's in charge this week. What's the question? What do you mean, what's the question? You need to recap in case someone missed it at home. Which ex-All Black played international soccer for... Soccer, rugby and rugby league for Samoa? <laughs> and stats guy, you're up. <laughs> I thought you said cricket as well. They put off. Kariki, maybe. Um, well, it has to be in the day when you could go between international teams. Which is not that so long it was ago, quite by a the while. And it, it should long come enough back. Ago. Frank so, Bunce. So the ghetto laws. Frank Bunce. <laughs> close. What do you mean, close? Close. Alami or Amir? No, you can't have two. <laughs> Chelsea, well, you won't even know. Have you. One, so you didn't even know who I was. You say running a Bronco with our minds. I didn't even get off the start line with it. And he wouldn't let me Google, so I've got nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Come on then, put us out of our misery. No, I'm not going to tell anyone. You I'm just going to live this. No. No. Oh. <laughs> oh. no next week. Viewers. Viewers. Oh, you answered. Oh. Johnny, Johnny Schuster. Yeah. I was close. Yeah, you were close. I actually yeah. also thought he played rugby league for New Zealand, but he didn't. Yep. Wow, that's yeah. an he probably, that's plays, the awesome, mate, probably really. plays the violin as well. You know, yeah. there's people that can do it. Can please, thing. can viewers please send me some more questions? I enjoyed that so much. <laughs> can I, I just, can I just say next week? Can I do the trivia? Yeah. Ooh, Here we go. Just yes. something a little Sharing bit in the last yep. 10, 20 years or so that I'll actually I'm have a chance to bar tonight, and I'm saying yes, you can. Can I? Yes, you Thank can. Thank you. All right. Well, we've been Sorry, asking you for your votes on our greatest 15 All Blacks, and this week it was the Lucy's tough category. Here's Nisbo with a recap and the results. Thanks, Bernie. Last week we looked at the loose forwards, and the panel of myself, Ricky Swinnell, Ken Laban, and Phil Gifford picked Richie McCaw at open side, Zinzan Brook as our number eight, but we were split over whether it should be Michael Jones or Jerome Kano at blindside. You, the public, overwhelmingly agreed that McCaw is our greatest open side. You also agreed with us at number eight, but you were split three ways at blindside flanker. You had Jerry Collins narrowly ahead of Kano with Jones in third place. So we called in Sir Graham Henry to sort through the contenders at six, and he's gone with Michael Jones. So our greatest loose forwards are Richie McCaw, Zinzan Brook, and Sir Michael Jones. I think what made Michael Jones so special is he could probably play any position on the field, even hooker. He was that good. He just had that real natural ability. He was big in those days, uh, hugely fit, uh, athletic, and he redefined that position without question. Here's Michael Jones. Look at this. Where's the support? Kerwin. But when he was a seven, I didn't even have to look for him. I just knew that he was there. I've always remembered Nick Farr Jones, the great Australian captain, saying to us if, in our day, if we could keep Michael Jones quiet, uh, we had a chance of beating the All Blacks. Uh, but he just, you know, he's a, he's a Dan Carter for me, but Dan Carter dominated games. When he dominated games, the All Blacks won. And it's the same as Michael. Michael single-handedly could, could dominate a game. He could play six, seven or eight. Um, I even considered him as a backup to being able to cover the midfield centre. Um, that's how skillful Michael Jones was at his peak. Looking for and finding Jones. Michael Jones against Bronco. Stanley, Open side, number eight, blind side, didn't matter. In his time, he was probably the best in all positions. He's your dream player. He was steely tough, incredibly skilled, and the team always came first with Michael. At his peak, he was the best number seven you'd ever see. Um, he is the best footballer I ever saw or ever coached, um, and remains that way. It was scary. The Richie McCaw aura, the man, it is real. It's a real thing. Um, meeting the guy for the first time, he's not intimidating, but he is scary. But then the more you get to know him, he's just, uh, he's just a quiet guy. Now Aaron Smith, McCreden, here's the wiper's kick. Reed, beautiful from Reed, holds it up. Oh, that's magnificent! Richie McCaw in the corner. Oh, most driven player I've ever coached. You know, it's often been said by myself that he wasn't our most talented athlete, but by goodness me, he, he was so driven. 
to the point where he just wanted to be better every day. He didn't want to ever let the jersey down. He didn't want to let you know, other sevens down. He didn't want to let himself down, his family down. And I can't remember him playing a poor game. Next man up the ring, Richie McCaw. The aura he had when you played with him, you kind of felt like yeah, you couldn't lose or you were going to go pretty close to winning. I know some of the, the young uns were like, they felt a little bit uncomfortable being around him, and it was, it was purely because they were in awe of him. One, and the other part of, to that as well was that um, Skip was always on, you know, so which meant uh, he was always thinking about the game, how he could do things better, uh, which is what made him so amazing. Now we're through off the ground again for Carter. Carter for Smith. On it goes to Jane. Here's a chance for the skipper. I think so. He thinks he's got it. The way he went around his work, the way he operated, you know, first off the bus, first onto the training paddock, first on the ice bath, like, it was just constant, eh? Like, he oozed greatness, he oozed professionalism. To do that, you've got to be able to take yourself mentally to a place that allows you to then use all the talent and skill that you have. And that's tough. You know, that's probably the hardest thing uh, in sport to do, and that's why you get fluctuations in performances, because people can't do that. He did it. They're standing at Eaton Park. And that's why he's, in my mind, the greatest player in my time. Only taking the quick one, and it's a try for Zinjan Group. But his skill factor and, and his competitive edge you know, even now, he's hugely competitive, and I often get asked, this is no disrespect to any other All Black or any other player I play with, what one player would you pick to be in your team if you had to go to war? And it would be Zinzan Brook. It's back to Zinzan Brook for the try. His breadth of game, the, the different games he could play, um, his skill sets, and, and that love of the jersey was just second to none and uh, hugely competitive, which is, which is neither. It finds Cullen with a beautiful pass. Fitzy was lucky to have a guy like Zinni playing with him in the All Blacks, you know, because Zinni could run the game. Um, Fitzy would have his head in the odd ruck. The guy that constantly did the work um, and, and had the thinking process was Zinzan Brook. Now Marshall, away for Brook to get into the gap. Zinzan Brook! Try! Delighted. Great thinker of the game. His skills were unbelievable. He, he you know, hand skills, kicking skills, um, you know, a really fantastic rugby player. Certainly the most skillful I'd seen outside of Michael Jones. Give me something that you'd like Zin Zambrook to do in a game. And ask him to do it, he'd do it. I wasn't a big fan of Zinni's. First of all, I was really disappointed when Buck Shelford got dropped because I really, really rated and respected Buck. Fitzy took me into taking Zinni to Australia in 92. So I said, okay, Fitzy, that's a captain's pick, and I'll, I'll go with it. He said to me, Fitzy said to me, you tell Zinni what you want him to do, and he'll do it. Well, I found out over the next four years, whatever you wanted Zinni to do, including playing open side flanker, Zinni will do it. I remember having a, a drop kick uh, competition at Auckland training uh, years ago, and um, you know Zinni was knocking them over from everywhere. And I said to him, "Zinni, you're nobody until you've dropped the goal in the test match." And I'd, I'd actually drop one one goal in a test match uh, against England in 1973, I think it was, and. Um, well, he ended up with three drop goals, didn't he? So when he, when he saw me, he said, BG, <laughs> I'm the man. <laughs> yes, he is, isn't he? And it seems everyone has a Zin Zanbrook story. Everybody. AJ. Yeah, no, but for me, I feel really fortunate um, that I played with both. Outstanding. But Zinni was the most competitive person I know. He would take a golf club to dinner and you would have to play World Cup on the way home, like from the dinner table into the lift, out of your room, and he'd be counting. And he was just so competitive.
Yeah, I think you can back that up, can't you, Justin? Oh, yes, yeah, slightly. Being a fellow competitor. I know, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. He certainly was a competitive man, isn't he? And, um, look, I enjoyed being in his company because he always thought, like the coaches were saying, about the game all the time. But he was always, if there was a game of cricket going on in the corridor, he wanted to get involved in that. There's a game of cards going on. He was a real angry black, uh, backgammon player as well. Real oh, competitive. Okay. Didn't like losing that. Well, you didn't even know what that is. <laughs> no, <really. laughs> well, Chelsea, did you know some of these players? You said you've been well, doing a bit of Googling. Yeah, interesting. I've been sitting on the, I sit on this panel, you know, and I, I try to pick who I think the best player is, but I haven't seen some of these guys play. So um, over the last few weeks, I have been just getting on YouTube and digging into the archives and seeing some of these absolute legends and what they did in their day. Um, I've watched a bit of footage of, of Sir JK over here. Oh, he can loan you the VHS tape. Yeah, I know, probably, but oh, it's, it's just, VHS. it's been really cool. And I think, oh. to be really honest, it's something that um, current players like myself, we don't see enough of. I, I loved looking in those archives and seeing Michael Jones and what he could do. Just outstanding. Oh, to the greats. We talk about Michael Jones and, and yeah. you played alongside him in the 96 yes. series. I mean, what kind of player was he? Well, I, I think probably, I know it's a, a tough old game, but can I use the word comfort? Because, look, I sat back as a kid watching the Rugby World Cup and the exploits of Michael Jones in that World Cup. And then, all of a sudden, I found this sort of period that transpired between there to me making my test debut in France. And I'm looking a, a, a couple of seats away from me and Michael Jones is sitting there. And having him in the room and sitting next to you gave me that reassurance and that comfort that I was amongst... I was with a great player, one of the greatest players, and it, it gave me a huge amount of confidence to sit, look at him and go, man, we're going to be all right today because Michael Jones is running out with me. And, and that's, that stuck with me right through that period. And he had adapted his game to play blindside there mm. um, and changed the way that blindsides played. From, from being an open side, so... Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. I'm smiling because my vision's a little bit different. We did a one round two. Um, I came inside the inside centre and I was going as fast as I could. <laughs> right, come from a scrum, fast as I could, World Cup. And I turned on my inside and he was smiling at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, came the ball. <laughs> Calming influence. All right, as we work our way through the positions, we come to the halfbacks and first fives. This could see family feuds and friendships severed. Well, our shortlist for halfback, boy, this is a list. Sid Going, Dave Loveridge, Justin Marshall, and Aaron Smith. Going to start with you, Ken, because you're a well known halfback. Well, exactly. <laughs> oh, well, it's a very subjective list, as all of them, as all of them are. Um, Trapper, Dave Loveridge, um, in his era. Um, no weaknesses in his game, well decorated player, but it's hard to look past the incumbent. Aaron Smith, he's already talked about as the greatest of all time, and he makes a very compelling case. So for me, Aaron Smith. So he give a he give a list, doesn't it? And, oh, and an brilliant. area, and an, an area of the field that we have been incredibly well served in. Marshy, well, we could probably sit just tell stories about Justin Marshall, but <laughs> intensely competitive, incredibly committed, such a key part of that Crusaders era, and, and then you know going back to. To, to guys like Loveridge, um, but I, I agree with Ken. I think it, we've got something inc incredibly special in Aaron Smith, yeah. and he has got better. And, and perhaps like others, he could have retreated into himself a few years ago and not become the player he has. But um, he took it upon himself to be better, um, and he is everything a world-class halfback needs to be. I, I think we are very lucky to be watching him play at the moment. Strongest attacking halfback I've ever seen, Sid Gowan. Um, without question, the best single test display by Harper we've seen 1983, Dave Loveridge against the Lions. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Until Aaron Smith came along, I would have picked Justin Marshall as my halfback because I just think that Justin was so combative and so aggressive that it was like having four loose forwards, as we all know. However, I think Aaron Smith is just absolutely the whole package in one. Well, fantastic lineup of halfbacks, no question about that, but we're all agreed and the contender for greatest All Black is the current All Black halfback, Aaron Smith. Bridge puts him in a big gap, slings it off to Smith and White, the two halfbacks. Aaron Smith, that is sensational! Our greatest 15 shortlist for first five is Grant Fox, Andrew Mertens, Dan Carter and Bowden Barrett. Household names all. Phil, where does your <laughs> vote go? Well, this actually is an easy one for me because in the last decade of his life, I was in, had the incredible good fortune to live quite close to where Sir Fred Allen did. But one day we were talking about first fives 
And Fred Allen said, and I quote, the best first five in the whole of my life, and he was nearly 90 by then, Fred Allen, the best first five I've seen in the whole of my life in any team anywhere in the world, without doubt, is Dan Carter. If Sir Fred Allen says that Dan Carter is the best first five he ever saw, then I have to vote for Carter. Ken. I'm not going to be intimidated by Phil's attempt to use Fred Allen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go for Grant Fox. Uh, I had a look at some, at some numbers. I see that uh, during all his time uh, as an All Black, he averaged 14 points uh, per, per All Black appearance, as did, as did Dan Carter. Uh, I, f I feel that Dan had a lot more advantages in his game than Grant Fox had. So Grant didn't have the technology, he didn't have the coaching staff, he didn't have the coaching um, support or the technical support that Dan was afforded in the professional era because that was just the way it was in that era. Ken, are you seriously going to vote for Grant Fox ahead of Dan Carter? I am. Now, one of the things that I'd be interested in, those stats you look, how, what, how was Foxy's tackle count looking? Foxy wasn't there to tackle. In terms of what Foxy achieved as a player in the era that he played in, with the lack of technical, scientific video analysis support, um, he was still able to come up with a plan, a process and a level of consistency at the highest level yeah. that kept the All Blacks in that number one position. To be honest, I think Dan Carter was able to do all of the things Foxy could do, but added extra elements to it as in the attacking play, the running play, which, with all due respect to Foxy, Dan Carter was a better runner than Grant was. But he was also a fabulous tackler, Carter. I mean, it really was. In, in the game now, when you need everybody to be a, a defensive guru, Carter was terrific as that as well. It's a no-brainer for me on Dan Carter. I just think not only uh, greatest All Blacks, I think we could be looking at globally best. That performance of Dan Carter's against the Lions in Wellington was the single best rugby yeah. performance by an individual I think anyone's ever seen. Yeah. Certainly I've ever seen. And uh, he just displayed all the skills. Yeah. All right, well, we've all agreed, we've certainly all agreed, uh, and it was almost uh, unanimous, but not quite, that our contender for greatest All Black at first five is Dan Carter. Do you agree? So the battle for 9 and 10 commences. Pretty quality field. Mertz, Foxy, Bowden, Dan Carter. Sid going. You can even vote for yourself, Marshy. Uh, the vote is all yours at home. Head to our Facebook page, Sky Sport, and see if you can split the greats. You are with the Breakdown team. We'll be back right after this. Them up they now. strike, and they strike while the iron is hot. You're with the breakdown team. We have a week off from international footy, and then it's back into grassroots, really. Uh, NPC, FPC, it's why cut all the way, isn't it, Chelsea? Sure is. Yeah, unbelievable. We won't <laughs> go there, the team that I'm writing <laughs> All right, so um, nice to get the thoughts today of uh, Mark Robinson and also John Plumtree. It's a wait and see on our international front. And before we head away, our thoughts are with Totai Kefu and his family attacked in his own home in Brisbane. He was a guest here on Breakdown just a few weeks ago. Kia kaha to him and his family a speedy recovery. Uh, quite unreal, isn't it? Oh, it is, and, and it's horrible to think what his whole family's going through. Um, and, and he was trying to protect his family, and that's the type of man that he is, you know. So we wish him well, hope he stays safe, uh, and hopefully he, they all recover, and recover quickly. You know, I just felt sick. Mm. You know, I saw him mm. a few weeks ago. Outstanding player, but an outstanding man. Always got time to have a yarn. and think that someone can go into someone else's home and do that. Honestly, I felt sick. I don't know if it's been a rise in violence or is it just me? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it seems like he's in a stable condition, which is good news. But uh, you recall that uh, I do. near save quote? I know. That, that, that try breaks my heart as well because I was there tackling. That won the game for Australia, but um, I was there. You watched number 20 come across. And I tried to put my arm out to dislodge the ball. You see there, just that little wristy band went out. <laughs> and I completely missed it, so they won the test anyway. <laughs> 
Oh, thanks, thanks for rubbing that in, I people. Remember. That's twice I've been signed up on this show. Someone's taking the piss out of me with that halfback photo. <laughs> and now, you, now, now, now I've missed a try as well. So yeah, that I'll tell you what, I'm not coming back on the Don't show. Don't blame us for you here. <laughs> Don't blame us for that. All right, so uh, our good wishes to Totai Kefu. Also to Chris Ken's family, Sue and Lance. Our thoughts are with you. And to the All Blacks and their families, uh, all the very best to you all. Good to have your company tonight. Thanks to our panel. Jeff is back next week with a great ski tan. Looking like a panda, no doubt. Matewa, a very good night. Enrico, you want to win him? How quick he is. Here's Callaway. Callaway! Beautiful! And that's some sort of try. Mackenzie there, drops it to Reptalic. Oh, this is a great try. McDermott's off on a little run. McDermott, under the post, he goes the little halfback. Smith goes on a little down, but off goes Smith. And Cody Taylor's in. 57, yes, you heard it right. 57, 22, and the Blitterslow Cup will stay in New Zealand for another year.